Michael Hanna, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from your office in New Zealand. You are an author, paleontologist, and adjunct professor of biostratigraphy at Victoria University, having recently released your first book, Extinctions, Living and Dying in the Margin of Error. And it's the huge and perhaps very timely topic of extinctions that we'll be discussing today. So uh, how are you doing, Mike? I know you have uh, just recently retired. So what will life be like for you post retirement? Do you expect it to be completely different or just business as usual? Well, I think it'll be a lot different. Um, it, 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 what, what was originally meant to be a sort of a hard stop working and going to retirement has turned into more of a transition to retirement. Um, uh, so that, yeah, I'll be doing a little bit of teaching, I think. And um, certainly there's some research projects in, in the fossils I look at that uh, are either starting up or, or uh, I need to complete before I can finally fully retire. Well, extinctions are a very big topic and will require some very big questions. But before we get into that, let's just hear a little bit about your background. You grew up here in England and eventually landed a job way over there in New Zealand studying microfossils, isn't that right? Um, I, I only lived in England until I was 10. My parents migrated to uh, to Australia. I was born up in Cumbria in a, in a little ah. um, town on the side of the, the lake district called Workington. Yes. And um, my father, I, I, have, I was still a child. I have no idea why they decided to move to, to Australia, but they did. So I did my basic geological training in Adelaide and that's where I really developed a love of, of really old fossils which is a bit ironic because I'm currently studying very new ones um, and when I finished my degree I, I got a job in the oil industry uh, worked in Sydney for 10 years looking at microfossils from oil wells giving them an age and an environment that, that mm. the rocks were deposited in when, when the company decided it didn't need any more paleontologists I, I was really lucky to get the job in um at the victoria university of wellington uh where i've been now for 30 years it's been a it's been a long stint it's right the way through from my phd right through to to even the present day i've studied these little tiny microfossils literally little um calcium carbonate shells called foraminifera but more recently mm. in fact most of the time fossil algae, fossil pollen, fossil spores, which are really tough and can survive um, quite rigorous treatment. Okay, let's get into extinctions. Mike, to start us off, what is meant by an extinction and why do they happen? I guess everyone knows what an extinction is. It's, they're in the papers. You know, it's when the last individual of a single species uh, dies and, and there's no more species. There's, there's famous ones. There's the, um, in Australia, there's a the thylacine, and, and the last mm. thylacine was called Benjamin, and he lived in Hobart Zoo, and he died. And when he died, the species was extinct, they were officially extinct. There's, um, there was no more living thylacines. But, but when you look at extinctions in detail, there's really two sort of levels. There's the everyday background extinctions, the, the, the extinctions mm -hmm. that come from competition between individuals, competition um, for uh, places in the, in the ecology, the environment, the meal tickets. And that's a steady overturn of, of, um, of species. But superimposed on that has been episodes of intense amounts of, of uh, extinction, huge increases in levels, well above the background rates. So it's, it's those, those peaks that really a lot of the book I've written focuses on, they're, they're mass extinctions. And so mm. we have this sort of, someone once said, I haven't got the name to quote, that, that um, a soldier's life is, is long periods of boredom interrupted by periods of terror. And, and really life on earth is a bit that way, long periods mm. when there's just this steady overturn of species, then suddenly you hit these massive um, extinction events, and they were big. Right, uh, here's where we should talk about the major extinction events that have occurred on our planet. Mike, most people think of the big five extinctions, including the extinction of the dinosaurs, of course, but there have actually been a lot more than that, isn't that right? Yeah, everyone, everyone talks about the big five. It's a, it's a nice um, 
grabby, uh, press grabby type type term, and we hear that we're in the middle of the sixth extinction now. But uh, depending exactly on how you um, uh, define a mass extinction and recognise it, some paleontologists suggest that maybe up to nineteen major extinction events in, hmm. in the fossil record. And um, so th there are lots of others, and each one of them is categorised by, as I said, a sudden increase in the level of uh, extinction above a background level. They are global in nature, and they're very, very fast, I geologically speaking, okay? Yes. Fr from, from a human perspective, it, it's you know, several tens of thousands of years, but from a geological perspective, they're really fast. And these, some of these are big. If we just look at, at two of the big five, the, the end Permian and the end Cretaceous. The end Cretaceous is probably the most famous of all mass extinctions. Oh yes, it's got it's got where the dinosaurs died, and and, and the public um, opinion is, is you know, dinosaurs are just enormously fascinating. Um, and the, the estimate there is is about a seventy six percent species loss, at least in in the oceans. It's a bit harder to come up with species losses. On the on the land, but those that have it looks like it's a similar level. Um, so that's a massive extinction loss. But in Permian is even bigger. The estimates there is about a ninety six percent species loss in the oceans. Um, on land, it's it's similarly it's high, but, but it, as I said, it's harder to get a, an exact handle on that. I I, I guess I, I sit and think of what the, the, the planet's oceans would look like if so quickly you lose 96 percent of all species that ever ever lived that were living at the time um at the end of the permian the, the, there's no reefs the coral reefs are wiped from the, the face of the planet and we don't get them back for 20 million years on land um the swamps and and the the, the sort of environments that produce coal just disappear um and they're not recovered until several million years later in the early part of the Triassic. So these, these are massive and devastating events. There are smaller ones. Um, there's one that happened maybe 50 to 10,000 years ago that some people argue isn't a mass extinction, but I, in my book I do argue it is. Um, when the, 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 what's called the megafauna disappeared, there's the mammoths yeah. and the saber-toothed tigers. Oh, yes. and the, um, in Australia, there was a seven-meter goanna that disappeared, and three-meter-high kangaroos. Um, so that's the Pleistocene, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the Quaternary megafauna extinctions yeah. they're called, um, and yeah. there's lots of arguments about what caused those. But so there's a whole range of size, sizes. The biggest is the one at the end of the Permian. Well, I know that people watching this will be most interested in the demise of the dinosaurs in the KPG event 66 million years ago. That, of course, was the fault of an asteroid's collision with the Earth. But what facts do we now know for sure about this event? And what are the basic misunderstandings surrounding it? Can I start with a personal dislike, and that's the term KPG. Mm. And that's, it's simply, it's, it's purely personal. It sounds like an accounting firm. Um, <laughs> And I, I guess it I, does. I, <laughs> and I, I used to be KT, and, and then they moved to T, so we, we, we're reduced to KPG. So I actually refer to it as the end Cretaceous event. It's just purely cussedness on my part. Um, it, it is probably the most famous of all mass extinctions. The mm -hmm. dinosaurs went extinct, um, and the, 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 the hold the dinosaurs have on, on everyone's mind is, is enormous. Um, but it's also controversial in that there is there is two events happening at, at the same time we've got undoubtedly the asteroid and but at the same time in india there is a massive volcanic eruption uh, called the deccan traps and most mass extinctions at least over the last 500 million years are associated with these huge volcanic events that they call large igneous problems in placements of large igneous provinces and there's, there's this tension between what what causes the end Cretaceous event. There is undoubtedly the meteorite, 
uh, uh, when I first heard about it, I, I sort of threw my hands up and said, no, it didn't happen. Um, but you know, the evidence came in thick and fast, and, and, and there's no doubt that, that a meteorite slammed into the planet. Yeah, the uh, Yucatan, was, isn't that right? It's in Yucatan. Uh, uh, I think it's pronounced Chicxulub. Uh, and they've just, they've just drilled the uh, last couple of years. They've drilled the, yeah. the old crater because most of the crater is offshore. Uh, and they've produced this, this lovely paper. It's called the, the First Day of the Cenozoic, um, in which they document in enormous detail the, the, the story of this meteorite hitting, the development of a crater, the slumping back into the crater, the tsunamis that flood apart and then come back in and, and, and fill the crater. It, uh, and the timing down to sort of, you know, so many hours after, after impact, so many days after impact. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a wow. very, very um, channel, uh, detailed sort of story. And the argument is that when this thing hits, um, there, is a, there is a lot of soot and, and debris thrown into the atmosphere, which reduces the amount of sunlight in the earth and, and a collapse mm -hmm. of the, the ecosystem. Talk to my my old supervisor about it, and, and I was talking about the impact. He said, "Ah, the end of the Cretaceous was a was a, an accident waiting to happen," um, because at the same time, for, for about a, a million years beforehand, you have this massive volcanic eruption going on, and the carbon dioxide levels were going up, temperature was rising, oceans were becoming more acidic um, and more oxygen depleted, and yeah. it, it's as if you know. Which it was teetering on the edge of um, a mass extinction, and then the, the final coup de grace is provided by the meteorite. And, and the tension is, how much do we wait? Do we put on either the meteorite or the volcanic activity? And there are people who would say, oh, no, it's, it's entirely the meteorite. And other people say, oh, it's, it's most probably the, well, they can't deny the meteorite, but they, they say the um, volcanic eruption has a much more Ah. bigger role a bigger role in the in the extinctions um and and the, the other thing about the cretaceous is is although we focus on the dinosaurs because the non-avian dinosaurs are the ones that went flying um it, it's in the oceans where the major extinction events occur i mean we lose all marine reptiles the ichthyosaurs plesiosaurs um yes. in, in in the field that i worked in in the little tiny microfossils four m um when I did my work on it, you couldn't actually see which species made it through uh, into the uh, paleogene. Um, you can't look for a solution that is dino-centric, although people did. There's a, a lovely bit in Michael Benton's book, When when Life Nearly Died, when he lists, I think, about 100 uh, reasons why dinosaurs might have gone extinct. And they're all published scientific ideas, things like you know, mm. diseases, AIDS, um, psychotic episodes. And, and my favourite was... Um, they died of constipation because the uh, <laughs> the roughage they ate died out. But it's a complicated um, it's a complicated uh, event. I think both the the meteorite and the the, uh, the um, uh, volcanic eruptions are involved, and the volcanic eruption simply set the scene for for the devastation caused by the meteorite. A combination. Um, I, yeah, I, and, and when you look back through the other mass extinctions, it's often hmm. two events. Yes, I've said that they, they're all associated with a volcanic eruption, but there's often something else at the same time. Um, it's if you need some sort of amazing coincidence to actually make it a, a mass extinction. And of course, once the dinosaurs died out, it left a whole suite of... Um, niches available for new species to evolve into yes. and um of course at the other end of that there's the mammals does sort of take the place but in between in fact it was the birds that tried very hard to become the dominant species on earth um but then the mammals just just took off yeah and i bet mike you would like to get your hands on some of those cores that they dug in the yucatan <laughs> considering I, I actually, you you worked on, on cores back in the in the, the yeah, Orc I, I, I did um the only trouble is with the Yucatan cores is that uh, the the rocks that wouldn't have microfossils in them because they're all melts wow. and breaches and, and uh, hard rocks wow. that, that wouldn't contain Even microfossils. So. <laughs> Even so, it'd be nice to see them. Um, yeah. And it, I know that they drilled into the centre of the crater to look at the, the, the fill 
and that contains microfossils. And there was a lot of arguing about, you know, what's the age of the, the, the crater, but now it's tied down very precisely to the um, end of the uh, Cretaceous. Well, another question that comes to mind is how we recover from a mass extinction. What have we learned from the past? And is recovery always inevitable? That's an interesting question, Mark, but the fact that you're sitting here asking me the questions indicates that your ancestors and your ancestors' ancestors, all the way back to that single cell 3.7 billion years ago, have been really, really good at surviving. They've survived all the vicissitudes of life. They've survived every single mass extinction event, whether you believe there's five or 19. Um, and you've, they've made it through. Every, life makes it through all mass mm. extinctions. But what we don't know and can't tell is what life makes it through. It's, it's, it, it's almost impossible to predict before a mass extinction what life will re-evolve at the other end because evolution will just take whatever's survived and, and fill the nation issues with that. So... It's been a chancy process along the way, but we've, we've managed to do that. And we can see recoveries from mass extinction. There's a lovely uh, section in the west coast of, of, of New Zealand, where I live now, that some uh, uh, paleontologists, people look at fossil pollen, documented a really nice succession. They, they, they had a lovely complex ecosystem in the late Cretaceous, and that completely wiped out at the extinction event because these events do affect plants as much as they affect the animals. Ah, uh, yes, the phytoliths, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, phytoliths are part of it, but these are actually fossil pollen. Um, oh, I see, yes. That they've done. And they've, they've, they document, first of all, a ferns, enormous numbers of ferns are the first plants back. And then as you go through time, as you look at younger and younger samples, you see the ecosystem being reestablished. And it takes a certain length of time before the complexity that was there beforehand is, is, re, is replaced. And it's the same story. Is, the trouble with the Western Australian, Western, Western Australian, Western Tasmania, Western New Zealand one, is that we don't have a good age on them. But in Colorado, there's another section which you can see the same pattern. You can see the... Um, a uh, fern spike at the bottom and then the plants recovering in a complex ecosystem and alongside of that they've also got um mammals that they, they, they shrink become a disaster species small insectivorous ones then as the plants recover you can see these um mammals recovering alongside them to reflect what's going on back forwards and that section is very well dated and the author suggests it's about a million years to, to, to come back to where it was before the mass extinction. And, and it, it's been suggested that this recovery, this structured recovery is actually really similar to what we'd see following a major forest fire or, or a flood that you have pioneer species and then mm. um, other species come in to, to um, restore the, the, the diversity. And it's the, the, it just the difference, of course, is the scale we're looking at millions of years um, yes. to recover and we're looking at a global situation but we're looking at the at systems and, and changes and accumulation of, of complexity and they're, they're calling it a system succession uh, to, 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 to see the whole yeah. system coming back online again after being effectively devastated by mass extinction mike in your book you give a very positive outlook for the world in terms of avoiding a possible mass extinction ourselves so First of all, are we teetering on the edge of an extinction event and what can we do to avoid one? Thanks for the positivity in the book. Other people have, have said that it, it spans the emotions from depressing through to somber. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I do honestly believe there is hope if we act. Um, we, what I was trying to do is set the modern um, biosphere, the modern biotic crisis, into its historical setting. How does it compare to the previous mass extinctions? And if we look at the end Permian mass extinctions, there's some frightening parallels. The, the end Permian um, massive increases in carbon dioxide, 
massive increases in methane, which is happening now. The oceans at the end of the Permian went anoxic from probably the bottom up to the top. They became more acidic. And these are words and, and things, if you listen to what's coming out of COP26, this is the stuff that's happening now. So we are scene setting a mass extinction. Um, the rate at which species are going extinct are significantly higher now than they were before humans. And, and that, that was calculated based on um, mammals, but we, it, it's clear that it's, it's applicable across the entire biota. So we've increased the rate of extinctions. We've set the scene for mass extinction. We're teetering on the edge of one. The only thing we've got that is in our favor is that the level of extinction is nowhere near the 76 or 96% uh -huh. um, of the mass extinctions for the end of the Permian, end of the Cretaceous. And we don't want to go there. Um, and, and the numbers you get from the Red Book at the moment are very low. And that worries me that people can sort of hide behind the fact, oh, well, we don't have to worry because our extinction is, you know, what are these people talking about? Our extinction rates are, are high, but we've only lost, you know, 1% of this group or 4% of this group. Hmm. So I think this is why I don't like actually referring to the current crisis as the sixth extinction, because we're not at the same level as the mass extinction. Yeah. But what we need to do is look at not just what animals are going extinct, but add to that the ones we are threatening with extinction. When we do that, then the numbers jump. They get up to 30, 28% of, of, of both extinct and threatened with extinctions in many groups. So that, that, that's what we're facing. We, 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 are, we have time, if we can save those threatened species and reduce the level of extinctions, then we've got time to, um, to save a sliding into a mass extinction. We haven't got a lot of time, but we've got some. We should act on it. Um, to, to, how do we do that? And, and, and um, yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's in the book. Perhaps I should have sort of had another chapter at the end and said this is what we should be doing. Um, first and foremost, we, we do have to reduce our emissions. Um, we, we have to meet the 1.5% the um, Paris target. Um, and I get very depressed when I listen to what's coming out of COP26 because I can't see the, yeah. the, 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 the real nuts and bolts of that happening, but we have to do that. But we can help it along by preserving the biosphere we've got. So that as well as reducing emissions, we can also start stopping losing the biosphere. Um, and there was a really interesting opinion piece brought out this year, actually, and, I, and it's one of those papers you wish you'd seen before you'd written the book um and, and they this group read by by um someone called Ro rockstrom said that, that there is a solution to to um help us meet the meet, reduce the level the temperature levels they called it natural climate solutions and they suggest and i've got it written down here so i'll, I'll cheat and read it they suggest, first of all, we have to safeguard carbon stocks in vulnerable ecosystems. That means the ecosystem that is absorbing the carbon now, like the tiger and the forests um, and the, the permafrost, we have to preserve them. We have to stop losing those. For agricultural land, we have to encourage them to, to absorb more carbon, so plant more um, trees, more plants. And we have, to, for areas of the planet we've already degraded, we need to really restore and, re and regenerate those. And that sounds like a big task, but uh, there was some modeling done um, a couple of years ago that suggested if we can save only 30% of um, our degraded forests, just 30% of certain key areas, we would manage to save about 71% of the species we have currently under threat. And as a bonus, when, uh, as these things regenerate, we absorb enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So there is, there are ways forward if we've got the will to do that. Absolutely. And I'm sure you'll agree, Mike, we're living in the only time where there's a species on Earth, namely us, who are aware of extinctions and aware that we can do something about it. That never happened before. Uh, absolutely. Um, we're, 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 we're we're a very unique animal. We, 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 we hold 
the fate of the planet in our hands like no other creature has ever done. Um, and, and yet in lots of cases I get frustrated because there are clearly people out there who don't see the importance of doing what needs to be done. Well, as we said, your new book is out now, entitled Extinctions, Living and Dying in the Margin of Error. Mike, what drove you to write this book in the first place, and what can people expect from it? I've always been interested in big picture stuff. Uh, right from when I was doing my training back in Adelaide, I, I, I was interested in not just the detailed nitty gritty stuff I was doing as part of my PhD, but the bigger pictures, you know, the, the, the evolution of new life, the um, transitions between one group of animals and the next. So I thought I'd write a book about diversity. And, and the original plan was to do this massive volume on uh, history of biodiversity through time. And it soon became perfectly clear that it would be a you know, 17 volume epic. But as I was putting it together, these other themes started to appear. And, mm. and so I've, I've sort of concentrated on, on the idea that we are looking at a, a major problem and how does that ref, is that reflected in, in the in the past i guess um the, the the whole book is all a plea to say that history is really important and we need to pay attention to what it does and i, I start with a maori proverb which i won't insult maori by attempting to pronounce but it, it says i walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed firmly on the past and, and that's so true that we should mm. be looking for guidance for what happens next, for what has already happened. Um, so it, it's, uh, that, that's what I was attempting to do. So the, the book, as I said, sets, tries to set the current biotic crisis into its historical setting. But it, it is broader than that. It, it, it also covers, uh, I have to do some, I, I have a chapter on the fossil record and how that is, is, um, biased one way or the other um and the other theme that runs through the book which we haven't touched on is is this thing called the earth system um which is the earth effectively the earth life support system and the bias here is absolutely crucial to maintaining that life support system so um I, I mean, I'm, I'm i'm proud of the book it's as i said it's not what i intended to write but it's it's i think a far more readable <laughs> account than than the um the size of the book would have probably challenged War and Peace. And a very, very important book as well. Well, thank you for saying so. I, I appreciate that. Well, it's been great talking to you, Mike, and I'm sure that this book is going to open a lot of eyes and get people talking, not only about the past, but about the future as well. So what's next for you? Are there any projects you can tell us about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's there's a few. As I said, my my retirement has become a transition to retirement rather than um, a, a straightforward retirement. Uh, they're, they're all biostratigraphic type reports. I am in, you know, committed to a new book or anything like that. Um, there are there are projects that I had to put on hold while I, I finished the book off and, and got it through its um, uh, printing and, and publication process. I, I started, I have some very lovely colleagues in, in the Netherlands that I've, I've worked with for years and um i start. i was living there a couple of years ago and, and i started a project that has to be done um because i promised i would do that and there's a couple of other new ones starting up too so there'll, there'll be lots of microfossils to look at um and lots of work to be done that way and i'll probably probably be doing a little bit of teaching i will leave links to your book and social media in the description below and all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed mike for coming on evolution soup well thank you for having me i've, I've enjoyed the conversation um I, i've i'm still beginner interviews but I've, uh, i find your questions to be very insightful so thank you again for having me